Hello and welcome. At the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, the field of science came under intense scrutiny, particularly with the questions raised and the curious pattern of spread of the new strain of the coronavirus. With science linked to the politics of the origin of the coronavirus, the world looks to the scientific community for its professionalism and integrity. A huge task, I tell you, when you consider that it is now split between the conspiracy theorists and those who believe COVID-19 is naturally occurring. Today, we explore the subject once again in a bit to gain in new knowledge. Welcome to Fireworks. Welcome once again to Fireworks. My guest today is Dr. Mohammed Munir virologist at the Lancaster University, United Kingdom. Welcome to the program, Dr. Munir. Pleasure to be here. Okay, so my guest uh, in the immediate past, uh, about two editions ago of the program, uh, submitted that uh, the COVID-19 is a recombination virus done to gain function. Uh, in other words, it is not naturally occurring, which required a need to balance the argument. He particularly said that uh, the virus has less features which, with SARS virus of 2003 and MERS, uh, which is rare in the coronavirus family. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, well, certainly the SARS-2 uh, uh, virus is not similar to the SARS-1, uh, which we now call conventional SARS and the MERS. Uh, and the recombination is certainly reported within the family of coronavirus, um, coronaviridae, where all of these three coronaviruses belong to. But it is really difficult to say that this is a recombinant of those two viruses, uh, or this is a uh, this is a synthetic version of that. The reason for this one is that those SARS one, the conventional one, and the MERS, those are petered out already, so those are no longer existing in the population. And therefore, uh, it, is, uh, it can easily be uh, excluded uh, the possibility that this cannot be uh, a recombinant or natural or artificial combination of those two uh, viruses. So are you saying essentially that uh, COVID-19 is not uh, artificially re-engineered and unleashed on the population? Yeah, I think uh, let me take you one step back. One thing is pretty clear that the information that we have got from China from the beginning isn't really transparent. So therefore, we cannot say everything for sure. However, when the virus started to spread in the rest of the world, we have massive information coming out from countries other than China. So therefore, we can uh, sequence them, we can look onto the genetic signatures within the virus, and we can make some assumptions on its origin and the way it spread. Based on the genetic signature within one of the domain uh, of the spike protein, which line onto the surface of the virus, is the site which bind to the cell receptor and enter into the body. If we look onto that specific site, which we called a uh, receptor binding domain, that is pretty unique and is specifically adopted to the human. And that adaptation cannot be done synthetically because that information hasn't been, been available before in the living history. And that has to come by one of the two possible mechanisms. One is that the virus has been circulating into the animal for a long time and then it's jumped to the human and it survived over there, or it been circulating in human undetectedly for especially October to December. And then from there, it acquired a, a mutation that led to broad scale adaptation into the human population, where the cluster of people were a little more than the usual one. And that's how it was baked. So beside these two options, I cannot see there was any third way that this virus could have been created. This has not been in the world before, and therefore it cannot be unleashed on the population. But there is also an argument that uh, recombination of viruses can be engineered in such a way that they leave no evidence behind. So there is no way, even if this virus has been artificially engineered, that uh, uh, evidence can point us back to the possibility that it has been um, artificially created. Is yeah. that... Yeah, this is certainly an important point and, and require a little bit of explanation to uh, explain that because this is not a straightforward uh, uh, way to generate it. Because I work with coronaviruses and I have developed reverse genetics for many of the viruses, including coronaviruses. So reverse genetic is a technology where you can back translate the genetic information into a living thing. 
So that's not a new thing. We do use the gener reverse genetics to generate vaccine. We generate different mutant of the viruses to study them, how they can transmit between different population. So certainly you can generate that. However, you have to do uh, thousands and thousands of different mutant to come up with a construct that would be optimized to infect human. It is potentially possible. One can do it if they really want to do it. But the, given the, the, the genetic signature within the RNA binding, the receptor binding domain onto the spike protein, they are less likely that it has been man-made man unless someone has intention for years and years with a massive amount of funding to generate millions of different mutant and identify one that has a fine balance between infectivity, transmission and pathogenicity. And that brings me to the next question, Dr. Uh, Munir. For a decade, China's bat woman, Shi Sheng Li, had been studying bat coronaviruses, and the, her findings brought to the findings rather brought to her lab in December 2019, when the initial cases of uh, COVID-19 were discovered, bore similarities with COVID-19. How do you explain this? Yes, certainly. I, I've been following uh, her research from the beginning because I do work myself on to the bat viruses, not specifically the coronavirus, but other viruses as well. So when, whenever we talk about the coronaviruses themselves, there are four different categories, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. This coronavirus source to belong to the beta coronaviruses and beta coronaviruses all together, they are very similar to each other. So if you take all of the coronaviruses within this subgroup, beta coronaviruses, they would come very close to each other, more than 96% similarity within all of these strains. And given that th this high level of similarity between them, they have potential to transmit to different animals um, irrespective of its origin. So therefore, having a certain percentage of similarity from this one or the previously isolated, that is by nature, the way viruses, they, they cluster together in a single group. So therefore, based on just similarity, it's very difficult to conclude this common origin or is common source of spread unless two viruses with a similar sequences or sequences with high similarity, these are tested in animal to really assess whether they got same sort of properties uh, for transmission and for the pathogenicity. So if you rule out all these possibilities and submit that uh, this could not have been artificially created, how do you then explain China's uh, systematic way of silencing everyone who asks questions? Dr. Sheng Li went missing, uh, during which uh, she was uh, dropping uh, highly suggestive messages, and then she resurfaces to say yet again that um, the international community should cooperate uh, to study COVID-19. Uh, the doctor who also first uh, discovered uh, the coronavirus and drew China's attention to it, uh, Dr. Uh, Li Wen Lia, was also died of the virus. And uh, the lawyer who made videos about China's hospitals uh, was also silenced. And the journalist uh, was also, uh, also went missing only to return and recant. So how do you explain China's deliberate and systematic way of a cover-up following uh, the outbreak of uh, COVID-19? Yes, that's a very important question. Let me explain that. When uh, the virus started to originate from uh, China, I've been covering that virus since then and I've been studying when the virus was not even given a name at that point. And from the beginning, I have so many reservations on the World Health Organization and also for the China, the way they covered up in the beginning, the way they diminished all the possible uh, route to uh, really identify the origin of this virus. So certainly there are something that is not transparent. As I said before, there is something that needs to be done on a better scale so that we can really understand the spillover of these coronaviruses in China particularly. But one thing that we need to understand really that the geopolitical reasoning or the, 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 the way personal opinion are operated in China is different than many other countries. So we should not expect that the way uh, we operate here in the Europe or in many countries in Africa would be the same expectation from China. They have a very different uh, operating system and I do collaborate with different Chinese. They have a very different mechanism to work on under very controlled environment. So therefore, the things, if they are speculative that who has been missing and who have been not missing and who have been providing information or not providing information cannot easily be interpreted. And that has been one of the major problem in anal analyzing the data coming from the China from the beginning that make the whole situation very complicated. 
but also gave us a very false um, uh, direction as a researcher sitting from uh, sitting outside and analyzing the data that has become available onto the public domain. So certainly there are concerns, which of course the uh, World Health Organization has a responsibility to drill into. And I think one of the major concerns of the, uh, of the United States and the clash between uh, U.S. and the China is really on to the transparency. So I do certainly uh, agree with you on the transparent transparency and there must be an accountability for hiding the facts. But how much is really um, uh, the, the, the backing for the origin of this virus is something that is very difficult to conclude because whatsoever we can make the hypothesis on the origin is certainly a personal choice. And for example, you can ask the question like how we have identified the original source of SARS-1 um, uh, and the MERS because those were the, the, the way we look retrospectively. For example, in the wet market, if we could have collected timely environmental samples, sample from the cages, sample from the uh, animals, those being in the live or dead uh, places, or the, the people who've been working in their lives, such as butcher or the customers, we would easily be able to identify the animal where from it has come. And of course, bats were also one of those, but Main, mainly uh, this would have been in some sort of intermediate host we would be able to identify. But as soon as the wet market was shut, all these uh, places were cleared off and we literally have no backing up a retrospective way to go into and find the origin. So speaking of transparency, I'd also like you to speak to China's disposition towards calls for investigations into how uh, this virus broke out. I'm talking about Australia's call, but I'll be after the break. You're watching Fireworks. My guest is Dr. Mohamed Munir of the Lancaster University, United Kingdom. We'll be right back. Thank you for staying tuned to Fireworks. Today we're trying to balance the argument. It's the conspiracy theorists versus those scientists who believe that uh, this virus, COVID-19, is naturally occurring. My guest today, who I have been talking with for the last uh, half hour, is Dr. Mohamed Munir of the Lancaster University, United Kingdom. Thank you, Dr. Munir, for holding on. So what signal is China sending if it responds with uh, threats of economic sanction, sanctions towards Australia, uh, which has called for an independent investigation into the origin of COVID-19? Well, speaking on to the scientific evidences, I think this, this is a responsibility of World Health Organization because that is the way, um, way we, we uh, fund through the public um, uh, taxpayers' money to the World Health Organi Organization to coordinate the responses globally. And when it comes to the crisis that is not an individual country's concern, it has to be probed very um, uh, urgently and really to underpin the way things went wrong. So if, if an individual country comes along, there would be uh, um, uh, intercontinental uh, clashes which would certainly hurt the campaigns ongoing uh, onto the control of this pandemic because what we need is a coordinated global uh, effort. If, for example, Australian, as they have done, or the American, if they directly go into the Chinese um, territory and ask for uh, the questions that World Health Organization need to ask, this could lead to some sort of uh, major funding cut onto World Health Organization or onto the global effort. So my uh, personal view on the basis of what I see uh, the effort to control this infection must be some sort of international organization that can lead this trial and really understand where from it has originated and how the things went wrong and if to avoid in the future. Mm. Oh, Dr. Munir, I, I know that uh, your position on the origin of this virus is uh, scientific, is, it has to be evidence-based and it's not uh, artificially engineered. But a lot of things do not add up and which brings me to the next uh, uh, concern on the origin of COVID-19. The lab, Wuhan Institute of Virology, is just uh, yards away from the Wanan Seafood Market, where, according to the official story, the first case of this virus may have broken out. Uh, and uh, just after that, there are reports that uh, the, the, the market was cleaned up by China and then, uh, you know, cordoned off. Apart from that, the United States, states as also according to reports, had been funding uh, research on coronaviruses at the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, for years before the pandemic. Uh, are these, do you also think that all these uh, 
happenstances, coincidences, or there are aspects of the story that need to be uh, reviewed in line with the investigation that Australia is calling for? Yeah, precisely. Uh, let me explain that when we say that United States has been funding uh, a research into the into the China for the Wuhan um, Virology uh, Institute, that is a little different to interpret. We do collaborate internationally with different uh, governments. We do uh, collaborate very effectively between different institutions to really identify how we can work collaboratively, collaboratively and find the answer to fundamental questions. So that is not really different. Uh, it's a different fund than what we say that the United States has been funding. Similarly, I have funding with the Chinese partners that is funded by the UK and equal contribution given by the Chinese. So we work together and really identify the way uh, science operate. That, that is a different question. But coming back to the, uh, uh, onto the uh, leakage or the origin of the virus uh, from Wuhan Virology Center, so if you look onto the infrastructure within the Wuhan Virology Center, it has a containment level four facility. That facility is the highest level of facility where you can work with a dangerous pathogen. So there are literally no chance for the virus to leak out from there. However, uh, speaking let me, on let me just let me just come in there. U.S. intelligence wires. Uh, months before the pandemic had warned, according to reports also, that there could be a, possi a possible leak of a virus, a coronavirus uh, virus from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Intelligence reports. How do you explain that as well? Uh, well, uh, we've been, uh, whenever we speak about the pandemics and the future pandemics, we always predict that there will be pandemics, there will be more uh, spillover events in the near future because of the situation we are living in with the globalized world and with close interaction with wildlife. So having such statements have no value in retrospective way, because whenever you look onto the interviews, if you look onto the speeches and look onto the future concerns, you always identify people that are projecting that there will be a pandemic and it will be, I can guarantee you now record this uh, interview and I can tell you there will be more pandemics coming up down the line. So that is not really the point. The point is that it's very easy to say retrospectively, but this is not how the science operate. I think this, what we are talking about is a very serious concern and whatever we say should be backed up with the scientific evidences. Based on personal choices, there are so many things that can be uh, said, they can be theorized, they can be uh, projected. However, unless we don't have a scientific evidences onto the origin of the virus coming, leaked out from the Wuhan, uh, virology center, we can't really blame them. And I can tell you that looking onto the catalog of uh, uh, Wuhan Virology Center, this virus hasn't been onto the list. Of course, they've been working with the coronaviruses of different origin, but not every coronavirus is the one that can cause pandemic. We have uh, cold uh, flu that have many, at least four strains of the coronavirus circulating in us on a, on a regular basis, on a yearly basis, but those are not the one that would be of major concern. I'll bring you to yet another puzzle, uh, which is about the eugenicist theories and planned parenthood and the agenda to depopulate the earth and, uh, uh, you know, replace with a profitable vaccine sale. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, well, I, I, I must uh, decline all of these um, uh, falsified claims. The reason I'm saying this one is that uh, th th there's so much conspiracy theories, there's so much misinformation available that is not really backed up by any scientific evidences. We have been using vaccine for years and years to, to eradicate. We have managed to eradicate uh, smallpox uh, from the world through the vaccination. We have eradicated winter pest in, in animal through vaccination. And all of the diseases that we are having full control on are because of effective vaccine. So therefore, I don't but, really but, think but that... But Dr. Munir, ac according to vaccines.org, vaccines statutorily take 10 years to uh, manufacture or create whatever the scientific word is. But according to word out there, pharmaceutical companies who are in the race to make a vaccine for COVID-19 are promising that the vaccine will be ready in, a, in, in six months. How do you explain this? It is not possible to have an effective vaccine in six months and all the pharmaceuticals... But, but that is the, the word that is out there. That's the word that's, uh, that's out there. 
Yeah, precisely. People are claiming that there is no yet any vaccine based on the six month uh, uh, duration. We are already uh, ending f fifth month into this pandemic. What in one more month is, is not possible. So vaccine claim is something back is a different thing by having a product in hand and promise that this is immunogenic, this is safe and this is something that can be used to control this infection is something else. I cannot see a vaccine would become available before the end of this year. And even if it would become available at the end of this year, it would be record breaking because we haven't seen that accelerated report before. But I can explain on to, uh, uh, on to how the vaccines can be accelerated because there are generally 10 to 15 years procedure for vaccines to really make it effective, safe and immunogenic. But with this accelerated of approach, of course, the vaccine that would not be 100 percent effective would still be deployed because of the need and the urgency. But that doesn't mean that we should compress time uh, against the, the manufacturing of the vaccine. That's one of my concerns. And I've been always saying that we should not definitely shorten the time for the vaccine manufacturing because we have to follow all those pipeline required to make a vaccine effective. And you, or uh, in conjunction with some organizations, are also uh, working on some vaccine. Can you tell us about that? Yes, certainly. We are uh, developing vaccine uh, through collaboration with international uh, vaccine manufacturers. Uh, it is at the clinical stages. It hasn't gone yet into the uh, human trial. Uh, but that's, again, I would like to emphasize, I don't want to take any vaccine into the market or the human trial that is not backed up by effective lab or animal work. So therefore I'm using conventional approach. It might take a little longer time than the unconventional approach, but the way we are doing it, it is the way uh, World Health Organization have optimized these procedures over years and years of studies and defined those pipelines. If we follow all of those pipelines, we will have a very effective vaccine. It might take a few months more, but that would be something we should count on. And uh, um, who's funding this vaccine that you're working with, that you're working on? Yeah, it's, it's a British funded uh, project and I'm working here at the Lancaster University um, uh, through uh, collaborators uh, within the Europe and the United States. But we are not yet into animal or into the human. We are tr trying our best to make it available first uh, based on the evidence is in the laboratory that it is replicating very well. It is having uh, high stability and there is no any issue associated within the lab before we take up into the clinical and safety studies. Do you have any other financiers, perhaps via proxy or directly like the Bill Gates Foundation? I know not yet. We, we are trying uh, our best to raise more funds because as you can anticipate, uh, making a vaccine available is really um, an expensive pro uh, project itself and it requires a lot of money. Um, uh, not only for uh, the developmental side, but also for safety studies and also to scale up at the level that is needed in the world. So we are trying to raise uh, funds, which is always challenging. But as it stands, we, we have already a plan in place to really take it forward on a on a uh, on a regular trial basis. The way it so, so, be. so realistically, how long cumulatively would you have worked on this vaccine? Uh, I've been working on this vaccine since January. And what we have done uh, is, is a bit unconventional approach. Uh, by the way of saying is that, for example, if we talk about Moderna vaccine or the vaccine, those are RNA or DNA based. Those are very easy to synthesize. So you take the genetic coding of the virus, artificially synthesize it and use it as a, an antigen into the body and our immune system will detect it. But I'm not using that approach. I'm using more uh, uh, unconventional approach. And that is that you take up all the genetic information available so far. More than 7,000 sequences have become available on different viruses, uh, coronaviruses taken from different world. So you can clump, uh, co collate all of that information and out of that you can extract the information that is required for an effective vaccine. So we extracted that and we put into one of the vector that as a delivery vehicle to deliver the antigen into the body. And that vector has been uh, characterized into the laboratory and we are trying our best to make it uh, as safe and as replicative as possible before we take into the safety study. All right, Dr. Munir, we'll have to take your word for it and trust you as we continue to look to the scientific community for credibility and integrity. Thank you very much for being on Fireworks. Thank you very much for having me. And that's our package on the program today. We hope that we've been able to fairly balance the argument and continue to hope for evidence and progress in the search for a cure and perhaps a vaccine
for the COVID-19 virus. And until the next one, join us again same time next week when we bring you another interesting edition of the program. Bye for now.